guys, welcome back to Metal Tips and Tricks. Today I want to talk about buying a metal lathe and the process I go through to discover what's strong about a metal lathe and what's weak to determine its price. Now I have never found a lathe that I wouldn't buy, but I will say I've bought a lot of lathes that I shouldn't and I want to help you guys through those challenges. Now when you want to buy a lathe, where do you find them? My discoveries have always been on Craigslist. I know you can go to auctions. The challenge with auctions is you end up spending a lot of time and then when it comes to the item you want to buy, well, there's always somebody there that just keeps bidding it up and taking it well past what it's worth. And well, sometimes our egos get involved and we keep going higher and spend more money than we actually should on something. So auctions are not my favorite place. My favorite place to locate a new lathe is actually on Craigslist. And I have bought legs on Craigslist when I lived in Washington State, when I lived in Oregon, when I lived in Idaho, California, Georgia. And there's a lot of great opportunities out there if you have patience. Now, it, I know a lot of you are going to ask what is my favorite metal lathe. I don't have an answer for you. It's kind of like the newest lathe I bought is my favorite metal lathe. So please don't ask me what lathe I should buy because I really don't have an answer for you. But I will have an answer that my goal is to never spend more than $1,000 on a lathe. All the lathes I have in my shop, um, this Entco, my Hardinge, my Clausing over here, I never paid more than, a, well, the Clausing I paid $750, $500, the Hardinge I paid, I think, $800 for it. So great opportunities are out there if you are truly patient. And the way I look at a lathe, I start at $1,000 and I add to it based on how much tooling is with it or I subtract on it based on how little tooling or what shape the lathe is in. And that is kind of what we want to talk about here is determine is the lathe worth buying and what is the price that you should be paying for in the condition it's in. So when I go out to, a, to go look at a lathe, there's a box of stuff I bring with me. A uh, magnet on a stick so I can get into certain places. I'll carry a digital caliper, um, mics, different types of wrenches, of course a crescent wrench, pliers, all sorts of stuff. Um, you're going to need screwdrivers, a flathead, and a Phillips, usually just the normal standard size works. Allen wrenches, you never know if it's going to be metric or English or both. Hopefully there won't be any Whitworth. You're going to want to have some sort of mag base with a dial indicator on it so you can get in and check some parts. I like to have cleaners with me. This one has paint thinner in it. This one has industrial purple and of course you'll need paper towels and what inspection wouldn't be an inspection unless you had some Scotch-Brite pads and the Scotch-Brite pads kind of fit into this category because mattering how thick the grease is or how much rust is on it, you're going to really appreciate having that. And these are just some of the general tools I bring along with me. I also forgot a tape measure. Tape measure serves a lot of purposes. One is to make sure that it is the size that it was advertised. Also, you want to measure it to make sure it's going to fit in your shop or in the back of your truck or your trailer when it's time to move it. And let's take a look at this lathe and inspect it as though I were going to buy it. You find an ad on Craigslist and you call the person, you ask them a few questions like, why are you selling the lathe? What comes with the lathe? And you determine that it's worth your time to go look at it. You look at the lathe, the first thing you've got to look at is the bedways. You get to study the bedways and when they were in pristine condition. And that's usually at this side because it gets very little wear. And you want to look at this side and you want to come over you want to come over to here and compare the two surfaces. Now a, a great way of comparing is of course visual. You know you've got some tools on board, you can clean this off a little bit, you've got a Brillo pad, whatever you need to to get this down to look at the original surface. And what you'll find out is the ways on here do not, how do I want to say, contact 
So here you'll usually see a little hollow spot or a little bit of wear. And what you want to do is just simply feel it. If you can, if you can feel it with your fingernail, it's okay. If you can feel it when you touch it, well, those little edges, you're going to have to determine. If this is down, let's say, two or three thousandths, let's say we evaluated that, that's okay. You're not going to go crazy. The lathe is going to work okay for you. Now, the very first large metal lathe I ever bought was a Sheldon, and it was, well, let's say worn out was an understatement, and I didn't know what to look for. This was probably a sixteenth of an inch lower here than it was at this point and at this point. That is an unusable lathe. I actually ended up learning a lot on that lathe, reground it, resurfaced it, and got it to work, but it was a lot of time invested in it. Something else you can look at is usually on the top of these V-ways there's a flat area, and you can look at that width there and compare it to the width down here. And also, sometimes this area here is actually in really good shape and you can compare it to. If this is worn out or you're seeing signs it's kind of concerning you, I would just walk away because the bed really is the foundation to the lathe. Now let's talk about the tailstock next. A lot of people kind of ignore the tailstock and you don't want to. You really want to look at it very closely. You want to check to make sure that it moves in and out freely. And the most important is you want to put your finger inside this bore and see how it feels. Because if this is worn out, chattered, um, feeling rough inside, you are not going to have a successful time using this lathe. You can technically put a ream in here, clean this out, but this is a hardened way and it would be very I shouldn't say a hardened way, it's a hard surface and it would be very difficult to clean that out correctly. So if that has problems, I would probably walk away. Or let's say we start out with $1,000. Let's say we start out with a base number of $1,000 for a lathe. If I have problems with that, I'd take $500 off of right there. That's all I would offer from the guys, $500 because to fix this is really hard to, you can't really turn down this because it's actually ground to fit this machine. Now, if the tailstock sits a little low, that's okay because you can put shims under here and make it work without a problem. But you do want to make sure that the tailstock is in really good shape because remember, anytime you work on a lathe or buy a new machine, the shortcomings are missing parts. And missing parts, you'll end up spending more on those than you did for the entire machine. So as you're looking through this, make sure that everything is here. Now let's talk about the cross slide and the apron here. Most lays are very similar in general until you get down into this part here. There's a lot of extra levers and switches and rods that you have to contend with. And usually the bigger the lathe, the more complicated it is. Sometimes the older lathes get even more complicated. So you want to get yourself familiar. And one of my suggestions is to go to VintageMachinery.org. It's a great website sponsored by Keith Rucker. And there you can look up the lathes and find different types of manuals for them. Also there's one over in the UK called lathe.co.uk another great resource to find information on a lathe and find out what all this stuff down here does. Now the first handle activates a spur gear that goes along this rack gear and you want to check out this rack make sure that the teeth are consistent from this side to this side. Remember most of the wear is going to be over here There'll always be a little bit of slop. That is just the way it is because of the way the ge gears are made. There'll always be a little bit of problem there. Now remember that lathe I told you about that I reground the bed on it? Well that of course lowers the whole carriage making this so it didn't engage so I had to shim up the carriage to get it to work. Next you'll want to check out the lead screw and make sure 
that it doesn't have anywhere in this area. And you can simply do that by, well, there's actually a lot of different methods. One is you'll visually check it out. If it's dirty, you got to clean it up. You got to take a brush to it. Spray it down with paint thinner. Clean that up. Really closely inspect it because if that screw is not in good shape, you're not going to get accurate threading. A good way to just test it is to take your pitch gauge and just put it up against here and take a look. Most of these are Acme, um, but that's okay. You can use a standard pitch gauge and just kind of get a sense. If it doesn't feel right, it's not right. You'll know when you put that in there that it feels right. Check it again on both ends. Now, this one here has three different rods. This one here acts very similar to the lead screw, but what it does, it has a slot in it and a gear. So when this rotates, it activates the gear and actually powers this handle to the spur gear. And it's one of those things you end up using for different speeds and feeds. Just like this one here is basically set up for threading, this one here you can do a lot finer feeds. The third rod here turns the lathe on and off. It's really kind of nice that when you're working you have this handle in this area and simply rotates it. Now you want to check to make sure that these rods are not bent. Now it's really easy on these two rods because all you have to do is turn the lathe on and you'll see if it's out of alignment. It'll show in a lot of evidence. It'll be you know, swinging out of balance. Same with this rod here. If it wasn't straight, it would be very obvious. Next, you'll want to try the different um, ways of activating the transmission. This one here is a lock nut. What it does, it's a half nut that clamps onto the, onto the lead screw. Turn the lathe on and just try it. See how it fits. This one here is, of course, in excellent shape. This also has a threading dial. That's not a deal breaker, but I wouldn't buy a lathe that doesn't have one, except I did buy a lathe that didn't have one, the Hardinge, and it doesn't have one. So, like I say, this is different on all lathes. Next, this lever here controls the cross feed and is activated by this rod also. So once we're running, Try it down. That's going to activate the cross slide. If I go up, it activates the z-axis. Listen for the different sounds as you're testing it. If you're hearing any clicks or rattles or something that doesn't sound solid, you know, negotiate a better deal. Again, let's say we start out $1,000 and I hear something clicking in here. Well, that's about, you know, I would analyze it very carefully. I'd try to figure it out. If it's a broken gear, if I, you know, if I'm hearing a click, click, click that's very consistent, that's usually a damage in a gear, you know, that's $350 worth of work to me. I don't even know if I'll be able to get the gear once I get in there. Also, what can happen if it's a broken gear, sometimes you'll engage it and that gear will just be in that spot where it's missing the tooth and it won't turn and it won't do anything. You'll get very frustrated. So make sure you check that. Make sure you listen very closely for the whole thing. Next, we want to talk about the cross slide and the compound slide. The cross slide is really the workhorse on the metal lathe. And everything really depends on is it tight. So, you know, check it out. Move it around a little bit. Also grab your Noga or your indicator holder. Set it up someplace rigid and just see what type of movement you get when moving this around. If you're moving it around and you're out, let's say, a thousandths of an inch, it's not the end of the world. Usually you can tighten up. And that's the next thing I want to talk about is the gibs on here are adjustable. And on this type of lathe and many lathes, 
the gib is actually a wedge that moves back and forth and tightens it up. What I want you to do is get out your screwdriver and actually tighten this up. Rack it all the way one way, rack it all the way back to the other end. And if it starts to bind going one way or another, back it off a little bit until it's smooth operation. Check it here, see how it's moving, and hopefully you're not finding a big variance. Because if there's a lot of slop here yet, you can tighten down the gibs and take away all that slop, but you're going to be cranking on the handle really tight, and it should move really nice. It should be a pleasure to use. And this one here, again, like I said, is also powered, which is a great advantage. The, when you get into larger lathes, usually they are. The smaller ones aren't. It's not a deal breaker on buying a lathe for me. I don't use it as often as I could. Now the cross slide here, you want to unbolt it, you want to swivel it around, see how it feels. Again, you're going to run the handle all the way one way, all the way the other, see if it binds up, put the indicator on here, test you know, the slop in it both ways. You know, also I didn't talk about the slop in this, is there's lateral slop this way just because the screw gets moved out. This one here is pretty tight because it's a fairly new lathe. But you can learn how to work around that when you always push the tool in instead of pull it out. So it's not a deal breaker, it's just a frustration. This one here, the same thing. You'll want to put an indicator, test how much is this way. But it's also a point as you find little things that are wrong, just notate it, type it into your iPhone, whatever you have. And when you're talking to the person, go, you know, these are the things I found. And usually they're standing there and you're finding them. And you can kind of hee-haw about it, go, oh, that lead screws out a little bit, and look at that slop. I don't know, let me keep looking. And, well, you'll see the price will, it's easier to get the price down lower. And that's kind of the overview of the carriage. Like I said, there's different ones that'll have clutches on them. You'll want to try everything you can. And again, when you call, made that initial phone call, find out what the number is on the lathe. Also, on the corner here of the lathe, there's always a serial number. And sometimes you can actually look up the serial number like on a south bend and get the information of when it was made and find the documentation on it. So you can understand how everything works on and around this part of the lathe. So that's the end of part one of how to buy a metal lathe. In part two, we're going to cover this whole area and also talk about tooling that comes with the lathe. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, give me some thumbs up. Also, love to hear your positive comments. And remember, until next time, go out in your shop and build something cool. Thanks.